jump into this. Um, so welcome to our second of three webinars in our Rates of Ways Habitat webinar series. Um, the next one coming up is going to be March 11th. Um, and if you missed the last one, that one, as well as this one and the eventual one in March are all available or will be available on our website. If you Google um, CWF webinars is probably your best bet and you can find the presentations there as long with, along with others that we've, we've done in the past uh, of other webinars. Um, so uh, I will kind of host this and, and bring people through the, the logistics of Zoom and, and uh, field the questions onto our, our speakers and we'll, we'll pass it over to our speakers to, to talk in a little bit. Um, so just a quick rundown on Zoom and housekeeping stuff. Um, we're gonna use the chat. If uh, the chat is gonna only be able to go through to um, the panelists, so myself and our speakers. Um, and so if there's anything like technical that you can't hear something or um, uh, having a problem with video, you can send us that through the chat, um, but we don't wanna have people kind of chatting back and forth. So we're not gonna allow, like we can't chat to other um, participants. Um, what we're gonna use is the, the Q&A um, for questions. And um, we're gonna try and hold as much as possible the questions to the end. If there's something like that really needs clarification on any one slide, then, um, you can raise your hand, um, which is, you should see your controls along the bottom and there's an option um, there to raise hand. Um, so we can get to that right away, or you can type it in the Q and A, um, which is also found along the bottom to, um, to ask your question. You can write it in there and, and some of us will be able to kind of answer as we go, but otherwise we can hold questions. You can write them in at any point, but then um, we can address the questions um, towards the end of the presentation. We'll have a bit of a discussion um, feedback and, and a Q&A session that's going to be a bit more interactive as well later on. Um, so um, I'm just going to real quick uh, run down on CWF. Um, Canadian Wildlife Federation is one of Canada's largest conservation organizations. We undertake a number of projects uh, and conservation work across the country. Um, our mission is to conserve and inspire the conservation of Canada's wildlife and habitats. Um, which is, brings us to what we're talking about here. Um, and we do this in a, in a number of ways. Um, one is through engaging the public and youth in citizen science with programs like Naturalist Canada. We have education programs like Wild Outside um, for youth, uh, as well as the Canadian Conservation Corps. And we have uh, specific projects in freshwater, marine and terrestrial environment, uh, many of which target species at risk. Um, like the right whale, blandings, turtles, at-risk bats, monarch butterfly, which we're going to be talking about now. So this is a great segue into um, talking about our current project on the rights of way um, for habitat for pollinators. And I'll turn it over to Victoria. Thanks, James. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Victoria, and I am the Habitat Program Manager for the Rights of Way Project at CWF. Um, so as James introduced, today's webinar is part of a three-part winter webinar pollinator series specifically targeted towards Rights of Way managers. So we held our first webinar last month um, with the New York uh, State Department of Transportation, and that is available online if you missed it. And we will be having an additional webinar on March 11th uh, with New Jersey Autobahns, and it'll be focusing on how land managers can create pollinator habitat. Um, so you can sign up for that on our webpage and you can also view our previous recording on their webpage. And if you'd like to review something from today, you can uh, see that recording uh, after the webinar as well. Um, so on our next slide, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit more um, about the project itself. So to give you a brief introduction, the Rights of Way is Habitat Restoration Program. Um, what we are doing is collaborating with land managers um, on Rights of Way specifically. So this can include our energy or our utility corridors. So perhaps it is hydro corridors, pipelines, maybe solar fields, but also uh, roadways and municipalities. And we're doing this specifically to restore breeding and migratory habitat for monarchs um, and also having additional benefits to other pollinators and this is really in response to habitat loss and ultimately population decline. So what's really unique about Rights of Way is that they provide um, a really advantageous opportunity to conduct monarch habitat restoration because maintenance is already required on the corridor and with some slight tweaking of vegetation management practices we can have a really big impact. 
Uh, so on our next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about our team. Now, this isn't our whole team that works on this project, but it's who we have here today. We have James Paget, who's our species at risk uh, and biodiversity specialist, and today is wearing a second hat of being our MC. We have Carolyn Callahan, our senior conservation biologist and terrestrial of terrestrial wildlife. And Carolyn has been um, a real kickstarter in our ROW projects and um, pushing for our pilot that we had before this project and continuing on with us today. Uh, we have myself and we also have Tracy Atwell, our restoration ecologist, who has been providing some really key expertise, particularly with our partners. You can see those below on the on the lower right. Um, at the moment, we're partnering with Lanark County and Hydro One, but we are looking to expand to, to bring in additional partners. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But none of this could really happen without our funding support um, that's been provided by Ontario Trillium Foundation. So as I mentioned, um, just with the next slide here, uh, there are quite a few ways that you can become involved in this project. So the first is through um, as we develop and build our network for rights of way managers. So there's two networks that you can join. The first is our Eastern Ontario network. And through that network, um, it's specifically for this catchment area that our current project is covering. So that is um, through Ontario Chilean Foundation, the, the uh, Rideau, Kingston, Quinty uh, area. And um, by being part of that network, you can have access to peer-to-peer -peer, um, networking opportunities, to technical training, and then also to other types of training, including this webinar and our upcoming work shop. So we have a workshop, a free workshop that's taking place uh, beginning on March 23rd. It'll be online, um, 90 minute sessions on five days between the end of March and the beginning of April. And you can visit our webpage for more information and uh, for registration to that. And oh, uh, sorry, just switched the slide by accident here. Um, and so also you can um, join our new network that's going to be launching on March 23rd, and that will be the Canadian chapter of the Rights of Way Habitat Working Group. And that is done um, in collaboration with our US counter uh, our US partners as well. And um, finally, as I mentioned before, you can become a partner with us. So we are looking for additional partners, um, specifically Rights of Way managers on corridors that we can do more on the ground work with, um, whether we are providing um, some guidance, additional expertise, and any other assistance. So we would love to be in touch with that. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers for today's presentation. Um, so here with us today, we have Stephen Nichols, as well as uh, Robert McBetridge. So Steve is a self-employed project developer whose projects typically involve partners and stakeholders from the public, private, and plural sectors. So he has a really keen interest in the power of the P4s, and those are public, private, and plural partnerships, and you'll learn a little bit more about that today, um, and specifically positively benefiting communities at the local and, the, uh, local and regional level. So um, he's currently president of the Briars Brook Brookside Morgan's Grant Community Association. The acronym is BMGCA. You'll hear that again throughout today. And he serves as a corridor, uh, coordinator for the uh, association's Hydro Corridor Revitalization Project. And accompanying him today we have Bob and Bob is a retired biologist and a current member of the Ottawa Stewardship Council as a council member. So he's been working for the past six years on the BMGCA um, and he's been assisting in defining the future of the Morgan Grants uh, Hydro Corridor. So he's really been focusing on community understanding, support for strong community stewardship, um, and also just working to build trust and confidence between all the various stakeholders, so the community, the city, Hydro One, and other partners. So I'm going to pass it on to Steve. Thanks, Victoria. That's great. Um, let me just do that. Um, first of all, I just uh, wanted to uh, thank a couple of folks that uh, have led to this opportunity for us to present what we uh, what we're doing here in Morgan's Grant. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we really appreciate the CWF. I've been so impressed by the, the work I've seen and the webinars they've had going through the technical aspects of uh, creating a, a pollinator or urban meadow, as we call it. And uh, all of their expertise um, exemplifies a lot of what we've learned hands-on uh, under the guidance of the Stewardship Council. But um, we really wanted to build on what we've seen the CWF do um, by presenting 
more of the community perspective on how the partnership works within the community and between the stakeholders and really emphasize what we think um, is the story that we have to contribute to what is a, a very broadly based um, uh, initiative to take advantage of, of what is often underappreciated and, uh, and underutilized space in, in communities. So uh, we, we've gotten here with uh, support. Uh, I wanna thank the uh, BMGCA executive. Uh, they've been really supportive uh, as a group for the work that we as a, as a, a team have been doing. Uh, Jim Ramage uh, is uh, treasurer and, and has been providing a lot of support for the um, putting together the presentation you did today, we did today, along with uh, Alina Elnione and uh, a, a UW student, uh, uh, Eva uh, Sabrin. So all of those have contributed to what we're going to be presenting to you today. Um, we also, Ottawa and City of Ottawa and Hydro One have, have really um, responded to our efforts and, and it really will be, I think, shown today why we're so appreciative for what they've done for us today, what we're going to do together going forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this, uh, the agenda today is broken into three parts. Um, we have uh, uh, wanted to show you the very practical um, steps we've uh, taken through the course of the last five years, where we've, uh, where we started and to where we find ourselves today. Then uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the stewardship model, which uh, Bob has really championed and, and helped us develop. And then finally, how we uh, have planned our work and uh, what we see moving forward. Um, thank you. Um, next slide, please. So this, this, is, uh, this is our corridor and um, it uh, runs right through um, Morgan's Grant uh, in the city of Ottawa. Um, we are located in Canada North. Um, I've not spent a lot of time trying to position it. Um, the, um, the corridor, as I've said to Bob, who both of us come from the West Coast, we both uh, grew up together in Vancouver, um, separate uh, but very close to each other. Uh, the, um, the corridor to Morgan's Grant, in, if you really stretch a little bit, has the same kind of uh, significance as Stanley Park would have to Vancouver. It's, it's a really um, uh, uncut diamond um, in my perspective. And I've always thought that um, there was so much that could be done with the space to the benefit of all the residents of Morgan's Grant and uh, that it was something that just needed to be um, attention paid to it in order for it to be able to uh, really achieve the potential that was in front of us all but not necessarily um, being capitalized on because of all of the different folks that had uh, um, different uh, authorities, different responsibilities, and different perspectives on how the space gets used. Uh, it's two kilometers in length um, and uh, uh, is very close to um, the South March Highlands, which are a significant area for um, recreation. There's a, a big community of mountain bikers and, and hikers and all sorts of different folks who use that conservation area that's been uh, set aside and protected by the city. But uh, the corridor itself is, is overlooked in, as potential community green space. So that was really um, something that we wanted to, uh, to pay attention to. Um, Next slide, please. 
So um, when we talk about P4s, um, we really try and emphasize the important role that each one of the, the different um, members of those uh, uh, social groups uh, can contribute to as stakeholders to the um, to the job at hand, and and to do it in a way that respects and recognizes what uh, each one of them and the challenges that each one has in terms of being able to uh, serve the uh, the the public and achieve uh, the goals that they have for themselves, the, the the duties and cares and obligations. It's very complicated in terms of how each of those different groups interacts with uh, with the space. Um, so the not-for-profit sector, um, our community association, um, we, uh, we had to um, reconstitute the community association in a way that would allow it to support the work that we um, wanted to uh, undertake in the corridor. And the, uh, the community association partnered was presented with uh, um, to the community association met the uh, Ottawa Stewardship Council through the introduction of the then councillor, uh, Marianne Wilkinson, and uh, was really um, set up to provide us with the technical knowledge and understanding that we required to be able to um, deliver on what our community could achieve. Uh, City of Ottawa, um, multi-headed, um, so many different considerations at the city level, the political, the planning, the uh, departmental groups, the planning sector, the water, the, the parks, recreation, the forest, all of those different folks have uh, their own very specific day-to-day um, -day duties with respect to the corridor. but. Uh, what we what we lacked was was a cohesive vision that they could respond to and help us achieve on behalf of uh, all of the residents in Morgan's Grant, and then Hydro One, um, they have a, a duty of care to make sure that there's continuity of power. Uh, they have a provincial mandate. They respond to a regulator. They have uh, um, a priority on on the infrastructure maintenance. Um, they have people on site regularly. Uh, they have uh, uh, a cycle of maintenance that they have to uh, put into effect that has been evolving as uh, the concerns about power outages have grown in the face of climate change and all the things that they have to worry about. So it's, it's a very dynamic um, a set of relationships that we have to consider when we look at the corridor. So when you see the space, it's supported by the uh, uh, all of the different concerns at every level within each of those organizations. And so it's really the community association that has the clearest and simplest uh, perspective on how that space could be taken advantage of and used. And we have to fit within all of those other uh, responsibilities and concerns. So next slide, please. So in order to achieve that objective uh, of improving and uh, improving the access and increasing uh, the use that the green space could be put to for the community, we had to, uh, we, we stepped back and, and very much at the behest of, and, uh, of Bob and, and his suggestions around this concept of a stewardship of the commons where we take a very broadly based perspective on, on, the, uh, on the duty of care that needs to be applied to make that happen. Um, and uh, it's, it's a mindset we find that, that helps us really define the purpose that we have and uh, to give us some clarity in terms of our goal setting because it allows us to look at ourselves as people who are tasked with making sure that the interests of all the parties that are involved are, uh, are served and that we can take a look at each of the items on this list 
um, looking at the green space for the community, looking at the, uh, the ecological services that are perhaps under underserved and, and uh, need to be beefed up in the, in the event of, of torrential rainfall and flooding as we experienced a couple of years ago, uh, making sure that, that we can manage the space and, and uh, uh, make it safe for all the different people who might want to use it and their pets. Um, and then, uh, and, and seeing how that fits and is consistent with the broader ecological network that's evolving in Kanata North as, as we see um, uh, recreational pressures, development pressures, all sorts of things that, that are not necessarily consistent with uh, our uh, like preserving the green space as it exists. How can we make sure that it's, it's uh, serving everyone's needs and, and as good as it can be. So next, please. So what we wanted to do was just very quickly show you the progression year to year um, from where we started to where we've ended up with. Um, and in 2016, when we were introduced to the BMG, or the BMGCA was introduced to the Ottawa Stewardship Council. Um, and uh, we provisioned ourselves to be able to, uh, to manage the job at hand. Um, we, uh, we spent a lot of time with the Ottawa Stewardship Council, just really thinking about what it was that we wanted to do and how we were gonna do it together. Um, what each of us could contribute and uh, uh, how we could um, make sure that we had in place the, the right kind of structure and the right kind of relationship between ourselves back through to the councillor and the city so that we were seen to be a constructive and positive uh, a group that was looking to serve the, the interests of the corridor as we discussed earlier and, uh, and be able to um, deliver on what it is that we've set out to, that we set out to achieve. So it was a great deal of time thinking about the relationships with all parties. So next slide, please. Um, we, uh, in 2017, um, we had uh, begun our work um, under uh, a, small con uh, a small agreement with the city to remove toxic and invasive weeds and, and deal with the wild parsnip that was uh, uh, contaminating the, uh, the pollinator meadow and, and making complicating its uh, its use by the residents. Um, and uh, as we went through that and recruited volunteers, uh, Hydro One announced that they were going to be doing their uh, their annual their their six year cycle of maintenance in 2017. And to do that, based on changes in their in their maintenance uh, requirements that they were gonna to have to do a, uh, a fairly extensive uh, clearing of the existing bush and, uh, and scrub, which was very distressing to a lot of people who had uh, grown comfortable with the condition of the corridor. And so it was a, a summer where what was seen by the local residents as being a, a, a very negative kind of change, in fact, um, laid the foundations for us to see the conditions that were very much more conducive to uh, supporting establishing uh, an urban pollinator meadow, uh, and that it was a question of um, uh, uh, educating the local residents and the people uh, in the neighborhoods as to what the possibilities and what the outcomes would be. But at the same time, it allowed us to really get a handle on the invasive uh, plants and, uh, and weeds that were taking over the, uh, the corridor and uh, gave us a blank slate to be able to uh, really um, become realistic about the possibility of, of achieving the end goal, which was uh, an integrated and uh, uh, 
uh, fully um, integrated uh, urban meadow. So uh, next slide, please. So 2018 was when we really um, felt we had enough of a handle and we had a blank uh, a slate to be able to really get on with the idea of, of creating an integrated urban meadow that we would uh, we were ahead of the, uh, the the toxic and invasive weeds and we could start to um, the work of of building um, our meadow so we started to recruit volunteers uh, hydro one really responded they'd seen us and they, they, they'd seen over the course of the last couple of years that we were um, working really hard to uh, get the community behind us, that we had done everything we could to try and um, manage the public expectations, the neighbors and, and the, uh, the people in the neighborhoods bordering to make them understand that this was something that, that we could take a stake in, that we could uh, participate with in managing that we could work with the city on and so they were very uh, very generous both in terms of providing us with uh, uh, a little bit of funding to be able to cover off our direct costs everything was done on a volunteer basis but uh, they they contributed to maintaining the, uh, the materials and equipment that we needed uh, they uh, contributed courtesy of uh, Terry Tissick who was managing the, uh, the project for Hydro One at the time. Uh, they contributed B hotels for us. We put up uh, interpretive signage that talked about the, the nature of the community project. Um, and uh, we were working with Carleton University on, on trying to understand more about the meadow and more about what it, uh, uh, what it consisted of, the history of it, the plants that were there. And, and at the same time, we were working very hard to to reach out to all of the different uh, parties so that we could um, show them that we were capable and that we were prepared to not just talk about what we wanted, but also to deliver what it was that we wanted to see on site so that uh, it was a question of, of through sweat equity and, and through uh, delivering on the things that we said we would uh, deliver that uh, we were credible and that we could uh, be trusted to try and, and continue to make progress and uh, work within the bounds of what we uh, discussed with, with both the city and with Hyper One. So uh, next slide, please. Twenty nineteen, um, we felt that we were confident enough at this point to be able to uh, uh, go back out more broadly to the community and start to develop what the community itself wanted to uh, uh, to see in place. And so we uh, went out and um, scheduled uh, two, uh, vi two uh, uh, community outreach workshops. Um, the first was um, uh, in the spring to get ideas on what people wanted to see happen. And then we got back in the phone, Bob will tell you more about those in, uh, in the next section. Um, and what we really encouraged everyone to, uh, to look at was the blank slate that we had been accorded and that we had a space that we could work with and uh, see ourselves reflected in. There was a variety of different users and uh, we wanted to make sure that everyone felt welcome and that everyone had an opportunity to, to tell us what it was that they felt uh, they would like to see happen on the corridor. So it was not uh, necessarily just folks that bordered onto it. It was not necessarily just the folks who wanted to walk dogs, but it was everyone, recreation, pet owners, uh, uh, adjacent neighbors, uh, people who had kids who wanted to, uh, to bike or, or, or run or do whatever else it is. So that we had a really full, um, and complete picture of what it was that people wanted to see happen uh, on their uh, community green space. Next slide, please. Um, at the same time, we, uh, we had recognized that uh, volunteers um, 
were not the the only uh, answer. That stewardship is is a broader concept um, as we had envisioned it with the Ottawa Stewardship Council. That it was really important that we have a chance to uh, to to benefit from. Uh, introducing other elements. Uh, we, we reached out to Algonquin and uh, talked to some of their environmental uh, studies students. Um, they have a, a program uh, on, on uh, environmental uh, uh, test and evaluation that uh, we uh, could meet the co-op requirements for. Co-op requirements for these students are not always easy to find. And uh, they brought a degree of sophistication and understanding of the kind of environmental opportunities and challenges that these spaces offered. And at the same time could help us by uh, applying some of the discipline that they had learned at, the, uh, at Algonquin to helping us uh, you know, deepen the understanding and appreciation of the space we had and what it means for us to be able to, to turn it into a truly uh, uh, inclusive space that could accommodate all of the different needs and at the same time support the environmental uh, uh, ecosystem that uh, both pollinators and uh, small, uh, small wildlife uh, uh, like foxes and, and some of the other uh, migratory um, wildlife that we have locally that need to connect through to some of the other green space corridors and, uh, and green space uh, habitat that they want to be able to access. So we were trying to, to, again, build a comprehensive approach to how we dealt with our space so that it was integrated within that larger um, regional, local, regional green network. So. Uh, and the energy of the, of the students was, was a, a really big um, contribution to us being able to continue on uh, building on the vision for what the community could achieve. So next, next slide, please. So, and that then brings us uh, to the year past. It was a, a challenging year because of COVID. We, uh, we had ambitions of trying to to hire two students and uh, uh, deepening their involvement in how we uh, maintained and uh, continued to uh, uh, create an integrated urban meadow. But in the face of COVID, we, we went with one student and uh, um, made sure that what they did um, was really focused on, on building our understanding of how to eliminate the, uh, the invasives and to make sure that we were um, uh, consolidating and maintaining what we, what we had uh, cleared in the previous summers so that we were improving the space but making sure that we were uh, not extending ourselves too much. Because again, we really think it's important that we deliver on what we say we can do and don't try and go beyond that. Um, at the same time, we recognized that uh, there were limitations to the governance model that we had uh, been working under an informal arrangement with the city. And that uh, the, the nature of the agreement needed to be upgraded um, we, we saw that uh, in the next 2021 that uh, there was a new official plan that was going to extend out uh, for the next 25 years in the city of Ottawa and that uh, we had uh, an opportunity to put forward hydro corridor um, and rights of ways across the city as a category of infrastructure and green space that wasn't really accommodated or recognized uh, as an opportunity for the city to, to really work with their communities and neighborhoods and, and ward councillors to see, to see them developed in a way that would better serve the, uh, the ideas uh, around 15 minute communities and uh, accessible um, uh, uh, human transport, the, the biking, walking, running models that would would make these spaces much more uh, accessible and usable. So uh, we worked uh, with them. We were surprised when there was a miscommunication and we had a, uh, a cut 
by by one of the uh, maintenance crews at the city, completely untoward, and and uh, it was uh, an indicator that we really needed to reach out to the city and be able to um, uh, have recognition and status so that the the crews and 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 maintenance folks at Parks and Recreation could uh, make sure that, that the urban meadows integrity wasn't, uh, was respected and recognized in their planning for their, uh, the, the work that they do every, every through the course of the summer to make the space uh, manageable, but not necessarily usable uh, by the community. Um, same time, Hydro One has uh, recognized that they have a, um, a group of um, uh, folks within the uh, Hydro One that can um, take responsibility and, and interact with us and serve as a, as a, a point of contact for us. And then finally, uh, Algonquin. So next slide, please. So this, this takes us to the community stewardship model. And uh, next slide, please. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking way too much time. Um, this is talking about the, uh, the P4 and, and how it, it represents balance and how, how it helps us um, uh, recognize that, that the plural sector, sector, the communities themselves have a really important role to play in terms of how the green space reflects the uh, the, the community and, and the, the network of social uh, uh, relationships that, that need to be served in order to help the community serve itself. So next slide, please. And I'm gonna turn it over to Bob McFetridge and Bob is gonna tell you a little bit more about uh, how he sees the, the corridor and the creation of the urban meadow as, a, as our mission and what we're trying to deliver on behalf of the community. Thank you. Good, thanks very much, Steve. Um, I'm going to be fairly uh, direct and quick on my slides, and then I'll hand it back to Steve. Um, basically, the key to developing a sustainable community stewardship is to establish a sense of community of cause, in a sense that it, is, as it can be accomplished. Steve has sort of addressed this earlier. And this kind of a diplomacy, however, recognizes the uh, complexity inherent in uh, drawing together a diverse group of uh, people and organizations. It keeps a singular focus on community needs and uh, builds a comprehensible community vision and purpose. It's essential that the community's credibility is built up and established among the partners. This is gained largely by making a well-defined and agreed upon plans, ensuring that all the partners believe that their work can be attained and is attainable with mutual support, and that each group has a good sense of what their role is at its limits. It's also important to have a common understanding of what can be done with volunteers and where other professionals or employed services are needed, et cetera. This last point, in my view, um, is a, is, um, second, I lost my point. That is, this, <coughs> this last point, in my view, is a key element in understanding the full extent of stewardship. And, uh, and that is a large complex and encompassing is working with among, with uh, long complex areas like uh, hydro corridors. Stewardship is the shared long-term commitment of everyone involved to do what they agree to do, to assist the others where they can, to encourage greater engagement and support whenever possible and is needed. Over time, the successful meeting of the shared commitments will keep the work on track and the vision foreseeable, errors understandable and trust attainable. Next slide, please. Corridors, because of their core purpose, face limits and opportunities with respect to what can be done? Uh, planning an arid corridor is probably one of the most direct and appropriate first steps in this kind of an environment. The benefit of having a P4 approach is that it, it encourages a creative dialogue among the widest variety of potential and actual shareholders. And anchoring this breadth is the input that, are given that, that the given that the corridor planning needs is, it is to create an ecologically sound and social, uh, socially acceptable environment. For the purpose of the Morgan's Grant restoration, the community accepted that this means building a rich and biodiverse ecosystem, emulating a primarily dry meadow. 
the emphasis, uh, this emphasizes uh, native wildflowers and species of grasses, but it also accommodates the planting of non, um, of non uh, native species that are attractive to the community and that are valued by people. Um, this mix helps encourage pollinating insects, birds, and other species to expand their range in the corridor and increases their numbers as more uh, food and resources and cover become available to them. But such a landscape um, needs to be maintained and groomed at all times because it's a, it's a naturalized landscape, it's an urban environment. And so that means that we have to maintain and watch for no invasives and noxious species and keep them under tight control. Um, and the spaces become ever more increasingly more attractive and accessible to the community as well as wildlife while we're doing this type of thing. A corner landscape like this also becomes ecologically more stable, thereby helping to assume, ensure a predictable, safe working environment for the crews responsible for maintaining and repairing the hydro infrastructure and other services that may be on the site. An urban meadow planned this way becomes part of a growing pollinator paradise, expanding the, along the throughout the city's green spaces as we're hoping it to become a part of, yet never compromising the importance of its primary purpose. Next slide, please. The, uh, the um, Morgan's Grant Community Association organized its first workshop in April of 2019. And the purpose was to get the community informed and engaged in the project and to build a stronger volunteer base over time. Uh, the workshop was in two parts. The first being a series of short presentations on the corridor outlining what had been done and why and identifying the roles and responsibilities of the three main partners. Uh, the city of Ottawa is the landowner, Hydro One with the its easement agreement and the requirement to safely maintain its infrastructure and the community looking to make better use of the landscape under the wires. Breakout groups then sat down to look at ideas and brainstorm together around a detailed map of the cor corridor provided by the city. By the way, just uh, as, a, as a piece of information, the corridor that we are, we are addressing is about 90 meters wide and about two kilometers long. And there's extensions to it on all, either end because of course it's a corridor. But the area that Morgan's Grant is looking at is specifically about that size. What came out as a, was a realization of the need for a well-managed naturalized urban space that would be sustainable, durable, and accessible. There was also a call for some of the privacy that had existed before the area was cleaned up might be reestablished. Questions were asked about what kinds of green infrastructure might be introduced, what would be compatible with the core purpose and satisfy the community aesthetic. Most importantly was how to count, control or eliminate the noxious species such as wild parsnip, struggling dog vine, buckthorn, etc., that are established throughout the corner, corridor and what would be the best approaches to do so. Um, next slide, please. The second workshop in November 2019 was a follow-up to the one in April. There was, of course, a lot of repetition of ideas, but also an increasing of the sorting of, idea, of details. The uh, workshop emphasized the need for sustainable and resilient habitat. It recognized the importance of encouraging as many native species as possible. But it also looked at uses of direct value to the community, such as community gardens, planting edible native species, and how this might be supported by the city and Hydro One. Pathways, seeding, and a dog park were also components of the corridor that were considered. And in fact, a dog park is now under planning as a direct result of an initiative by the current uh, city councillor. It's become apparent during these kinds of social discussions that although a simple core idea, an urban meadow, may be the basic purpose, what that what that means in terms of detail, what attributes the community will eventually see as important to them, and what will be allowable makes for creative and challenging discussion. The balance between establishing a viable, stable, biodiverse corridor environment and an accessible and community-oriented space for human activity is a constant cause for detailed and ongoing conversation. Establishing parameters for safety of access, good information, and effective servicing of the area is tantamount in the discussions. It was also appreciated that the corridor was in fact a component of a greater citywide linkage of green spaces that enhanced mobility both for humans and the growing number of wildlife species adapting to an urban lifestyle. Native species of wildlife sharing our neighborhoods can enrich the world around us, but we will need to learn how to live with them and manage the impacts. Pathways through the adjoining City network of green spaces enhances healthier options for personal mobility from walking and cycling to cross country skiing in the winter. Next slide, please.
So it was largely from the workshops and the publicizing of the information through the community website and, uh, and Facebook page that the project began to build a real, but hardly complete yet, um, community vision. I want to be clear, there are three fundamental elements that must be constantly balanced and rebalanced. There's the establishing and stabilizing a naturalized meadow, like ecosystem, with predominantly native species, ensuring critical safe access to both community and those who must repair and maintain the hydro infrastructure and other services that exist or will exist along the corridor, and improving opportunity for varied creative and healthy activities that encourage its use by the community. The success of this kind of vision will be almost entirely driven by a motivated community with dedicated and informed leaders, but building a strong sense of stewardship of the commons that the community, its partners, and even neighboring communities can share and benefit from that vision that offers opportunity to experience and appreciate the many facets of cultural and natural heritage that can be expressed when an environment is safe, access is easy and shared, and there is sense of her belonging and well-being to everybody involved. Thanks, Steve, it's all yours. Thanks, Bob. Um, the uh, next slide, please, James. What I want to do is just quickly go through this. Um, what I want to emphasize in our in our approach to the corridor is is the mindset we applied to the planning and and this idea of uh, future perfect. Uh, the idea that um, you have to look ahead instead of being focused on what it is that, that you're currently dealing with, but, but really focusing on that idea of stewardship uh, from the perspective of defining what we, we as a group, a collective really want, and, and then taking the approach that we're gonna uh, put in place the steps we need to get where we wanna go. Next slide, please. Um, so this is how that ethos, that kind of mantra applies to our activity. How do we uh, act as that steward to recruit volunteers? How do we uh, plan and, and decide what's in the best interests? How do we uh, deal with the city in terms of, of justifying why we have a role as stewards to be able to take on that responsibility on behalf of our community? And then finally with Hydro One, how do we uh, allow them to trust us to, to be even-handed and uh, collegial and, and uh, collaborative in how we approach our work with them on the corridor? Uh, how, do, how do we work that idea of, a, of an enlightened corporate uh, plural relationship? Next slide, please. Um, one of the most important things that we've accepted is that this is, uh, it's a very long um, and constantly evolving relationship. Um, we're always looking to try and adapt and recognize that season, that set of circumstances and adapt to what it is we're, we're dealing with and what we have to uh, respond to. Um, it is an exercise in patience and an exercise in continually educating and, and getting people to understand what the purpose of what it is that we're trying. Uh, the space is, is relatively small on, in the scheme of things, and yet it serves a lot of people, and uh, it has a great potential to provide a great deal. And we're always asking, what can we do better? Next slide, please. So these are the elements that we feel um, kind of drive us. It's, it's how we uh, conduct ourselves, how we provide um, and interpret our role as stewards. Um, it's, it's continually keeping these um, key points and these kinds of uh, duties in order for us to be credible as stewards. And uh, it's, it's making sure that we're seen as, uh, as honest brokers and as people who are, are to be trusted in terms of that public interest that has kind of led us to where we wanna go uh, and where we've gotten to, to so far. Next slide, please. And all of that to say that this is the slide that, that really um, serves to kind of blow my mind in terms of what it is that is opened up in front of us after these six years of working towards um, 
creating this urban meadow on behalf of Morgan's Grant and the BMGCA. Um, we have status with the city of Ottawa under the official plan. We have uh, the potential of serving as a living laboratory for developing the concept of community stewardship uh, in conjunction with the city and Hydro One under the Master Green Space Planning Agreement that is being a part of the official plan. Uh, we have work that we're doing with the uh, uh, Ottawa Stewardship Council on how we fit into the regional green space master plan that uh, connects all of the different corridors and uh, conservation areas. and for us to play a significant role in linking the parks and serving the community. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a huge opportunity for us to, to reach out to the other uh, community associations who are coming to us now to say, how can we learn from you? How can we uh, apply some of those same ideas and concepts to our community green space and our hydro corridors? Um, we have learned other people uh, are doing many other really interesting things. The, the Park People Initiative um, in cities across Canada. Um, so we're trying to build these links and continually reach out and learn from everyone else uh, what we can be doing better for ourselves here in our particular circumstance. Nothing is uh, a silver bullet. Nothing is a template. Everything is custom, but all sorts of these ideas can be applied and uh, everything that we have done can be improved by what we see others doing elsewhere. And then um, making sure that uh, with Hydro One and support from the city that we could explore doing this across greater Ottawa and how can we help? How can we help other people do for themselves what we're finding is working for us here? And on that note, I think uh, we can open up if there are any questions or interest in, in more clarification. So I'm sorry that it's gone a little longer than uh, we had hoped because I was hoping to have a few more questions and time to discuss it. So thanks, James. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, if, if folks want to, um, there are a bunch of, so there are a bunch of questions already typed into the Q&A and for those that have been typed in and um, Steve and Bob have graciously been answering them as we go, uh, Tracy as well. So you can actually see the answers that, to some questions that have already been posted if you wanna open up the Q&A by clicking on that at the bottom. So you, uh, people can browse and see what has been answered, but also feel free to type in new questions that we can um, answer as uh, on video this way. We have about five minutes, um, maybe a bit under, we can take a few questions. Also, if you don't, if you wanna ask your question, um, you can also raise your hand and I can give you access to talk. Otherwise you can type it in to the Q&A and I can kind of uh, read them out to Steve and uh, Bob. Um, a couple that have come in to the Q&A already. Um, I see Bob is typing an answer in about uh, if there's a high, um, hydro corridor map of Ottawa. So folks can see the answer to that as, he's, uh, as he writes that in. Um, and um, yeah, a good question from Jane is um, if you have, do you have a list of the wild plant pollinators? So the, the plants that have been planted and maybe a question as well as how you chose um, the species and the mixes that, uh, that were planted. We, we have not done any planting per se. We, um, we have uh, removed parsnip and we have uh, um, cultivated um, different areas by preserving them and trying to encourage the wild the wildflower mix that was seeded by Hydro One, but we've not intervened um, partly because Hydro One has um, requirements in terms of access or infrastructure. And, and we don't want to start planting until we have an idea of what that integrated design is going to look like for the uh, entire corridor. Um, there's, uh, there's plans for a, a dog park to be installed or, or built. And there's pathways that the community is using. And until we have a clear idea as to what uh, the city, um, together with uh, input from the community, 
we have all sorts of ideas and lots of suggestion around uh, uh, berries and, and bushes and different things, but we, we've not done any planting because we think that's part of an overall integrated design plan. Thank you. And uh, Carolyn Callahan here at CWF has uh, put up her hand wants to uh, ask a question or make a comment, I think. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, James. I just want to say thank you very much to Steve and Bob for your presentation and for exemplifying the power of partnerships. And, and, and I think that's what your message is really clear. You've worked extremely well in partnership with the city, with the Stewardship Council, with Hydro One, et cetera. And I think that's what it takes to get these green spaces uh, restored for pollinators and other environmental values. So my hat's off to you for all of that hard work and dedication. Um, so the question I have for you is, what do you wish you knew when you began this journey that you didn't know? And then what resources do you feel would be the most important to have for other communities? like yours who are contemplating this type of uh, project? Um, I, I think I, uh, I wish we'd known how uh, important the status uh, of having um, recognition from the city as, as a stakeholder. Um, sometimes it's dangerous to know to ask that kind of question because you might not start doing what you undertook if you knew how heavy that lifting would be. But it's, it's really um, a, a lot easier, I think, when you start to, to get the understanding and support. Um, and that's why we focused so much in the last little while on, on winning that status because we understand how um, having common purpose and, and having a framework that you can work within that, that allows people to understand what it is you're trying to do because it's building understanding that, uh, so I, 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 we could have focused on that and uh, perhaps had a more productive um, couple, first couple of years, but it's, it was a learning experience. And that's, I think part of what gives you the commitment is that as you learn, you understand better what you need and so status and, and improvement uh, recognition from the city is a really important part of this uh, going forward. Great, thank you. Um, another question that, that was answered also, also, but I think it's worth re-asking is if, if there's interest in forming partnerships to expand um, with other organizations to complement this, uh, this work. And I, it may apply as well, I think, to, um, I don't know if Carolyn or, or Tracy wants to speak to that as well about um, partnerships of the, the our work as well, kind of on an on a, um, Eastern Ontario scope. I, I think um, that the opportunity to uh, build a shared network of understanding is huge. I think that all of these small spaces that, that tend to discount and look inward, um, can can really scale um, if they see the opportunities and learn from others and and start to apply what people other people have learned in their particular experience and apply it where they are because there are so many of these small pockets and, and areas where communities can get engaged with and uh, and and put to really good use and and if you start to look at the volume of that, we're, we've been approached by two associations already in, in, in Ottawa. And um, it was an indication to us that what we were doing was, was gaining traction because we weren't looking out. We were really just our heads down trying to do what we could do here. And, uh, and because there is a common challenge in dealing with these space and understanding Hydro One and managing uh, the relations with the city that uh, people sought us out. And so it was, that was why we really felt it would be helpful to try and let people know what it is that uh, we've kind of picked up along the way so that they could find a way of uh, applying it to their own unique circumstances. And it's, if we can get that kind of uh, uh, self-help uh, facility, that kind of network going, 
I think it would make a huge difference to a lot of different uh, situations across Ottawa and across Eastern Ontario. Thanks. Um, so I think that pretty much takes up our time. So uh, I'll just remind people that this is recorded and it will be available on CWF's website. So if you Google CWF webinars, it's the best place to find this. And I will turn it back over to Victoria for a last word uh, for our session. Yes, thank you so much to everyone who's participated today. Uh, it's been so great to, to have this uh, continued engagement with you um, and really learning more about your interests and um, through your contributions and the, the dialogue and the questions. That's been really wonderful. And I'd also really like to express some sincere gratitude to Steve and to Bob for taking the time to put this presentation together for us and really share your expertise. Um, and I know that <laughs> you'll have a few emails probably coming your way with people who want to learn more. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge our funder, the Ontario Trillium Foundation, uh, for making this project possible. Um, so we hope to see you on our upcoming webinar in March. And uh, as James said, you can view this webinar uh, on our web page in the next few days. And we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.